Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive the King. Let every heart prepare Him room. Well, hello there, and welcome to Day 3 of the 12 Days of Craft Lit 2023. Today, we are bringing you stories that were requested by listeners of Craftlet. Uh, Alice and Jennifer requested first the Potato Child and then the Gift of the Magi. Now, with the Potato Child, I had never heard of this story. I'd never seen this story. Chances are you didn't hear the story before either. It was written by a, a woman who, on the book itself, has her byline as Mrs. Charles J. Woodbury. This is kind of similar to Elizabeth Gaskell always being Mrs. Gaskell when she was writing, but but I couldn't find anything else about her. I found that she was born in 1848, but I didn't find any death date. And then she was married in 1869. The story that we're reading was published in 1910, and that was it. I did, however, find her husband. <laughs> her husband wrote a book called Talks with Emerson. And part of it is a, a really quite fawning letter that he wrote to Walt Whitman. So I'm going to link out to everything that I found in the show notes. And if you are interested in finding out more, you can follow those links and go merrily down your own rabbit hole. If you do find out anything more about Mrs. Charles J. Woodbury, please put it in the comments because I would love to know. Either way, The Potato Child is read by me. There was no LibriVox audio for it. And if you get an Anne of Green Gables vibe from it, you're not dreaming. Anne of Green Gables was written in 1908. And this one is 1910. And I I think the vibe is very much the same. Our second story is by O. Henry, Gift of the Magi. Uh, he was actually born William Sidney Porter, P-O-R-T-E-R. -E and he was born in 1862 and died in 1910. So he died the year that our first story was published. O. Henry was really a master of a, a lost art. We don't do much of this anymore. He really focused on the lives of ordinary people. And while his stories were often humorous, they were kind of humorous, ironic, maybe even like a kind of a grim irony. And they also often had surprise endings. When he first wrote these stories, that was very popular. He was a very popular writer. But by the time he died, his stuff was no longer really being referenced and, and people were kind of saying, oh, he wasn't that great a writer. I think some of that is because his surprise endings and his twists and his use of coincidence almost verges on melodrama sometimes. So that goes in and out of fashion all the time. It has happened to more than a few books that we've done on Craftlet. All right, let's listen to The Potato Child and then Gift of the Magi. The Potato Child by Mrs. Charles J. Woodbury. It was certain that Elsie had a very hard and solitary life. When Miss Amanda had selected her from among the girls at the home, the motherly matron felt sorry. She is a tender hearted little thing, and a kind word goes a long way with Elsie. Miss Amanda took a look at the matron as if she was speaking Greek and said nothing. It was quite plain that few words, either kind or unkind, would pass Miss Amanda's lips. But the home was more than full, and Miss Amanda Armstrong was a person well known as the leading dressmaker in the city, a person of some money, not obliged to work now if she didn't wish to. If cold, she is at least perfectly just, they all said. So Elsie went to work for Miss Amanda and lived in the kitchen. She waited on the door, washed the dishes, cleaned the vegetables, and set the table. Miss Amanda lived alone and ate in the kitchen. Every Friday she swept the house, and her bed was in a little room 
in the back attic. When she came, Miss Amanda handed her a dress and a petticoat and a pair of shoes. These are to last six months, she said, and see you keep yourself clean. She also gave her one change of stockings and underclothes. Here is your room. You do not need a light to go by, and it is not healthy to sleep under too many covers. It wasn't so much what Miss Amanda did to her, for she never struck her, not in any way ill-treated her, nor was it so much what she said, for she said almost nothing. But she said it in all commands, and the loving little Elsie was just driven into herself. She had had a darling mother, full of love and tenderness, and Elsie would say to herself, I must not forget the things Mama told me. Love can never die, and kind words can never die. But she had no one to love, and she never heard any kind words, so she was a bit worried. I shall forget how kind words sound, and I shall forget how to love, sighed the little girl. She used to long for a doll or a cat or something she could call her own and talk to. She asked Miss Amanda, who said, No. She added, I have no money to give for such foolishness as a doll, and a cat would eat its head off. Miss Amanda had been blessed with no little girl time. When she was young, she had always been forced to work hard, and she thought it was no worse for Elsie than it had been for herself. I don't suppose it was, but one looking in on these two could not help but feel for both of them. Elsie would try to talk to herself a little at night, but it was cheerless. Then she would lift up her knee and draw the sheet about it for a hood and call it a little girl. She named it Nancy Pullum, and would try to love that, but it almost broke her back when she tried to hug Nancy. Oh, if I had something to be good to, she said. So she began greeting the ladies when she opened the door with a cheerful, Good morning! or Good afternoon! I wouldn't do that, said Miss Amanda. It looks forward and pert. It is their place to say, Good morning, not yours. You have no occasion to speak to your betters, and anyway, children should be seen and not heard. One day, a never-forgotten day, she went down to the cellar to the bin of potatoes to select some for dinner. She was sorting them over and laying out all of one size when she took up quite a long one, and lo, it had a little face on it. And two eyes and a little hump between for a nose and a long crack below that made a very pretty mouth. Elsie looked at it joyfully. I will make me a child, she said. No matter if it has no arms or legs, the face is everything. She carefully placed it at the end of the bin, and whenever she could slip away without neglecting her work, she would run down to the cellar and talk softly to it. But one day, her potato child was gone. Elsie's heart gave a big jump and then fell like lead and then seemed to lie perfectly still. But it commenced to beat again, beat and ache, beat and ache. She tried to look for the changeling, but the tears made her so that she couldn't see very well, and there were so many potatoes. She looked every moment she had a chance all the next day and cried a great deal. I can never be real happy again, she thought. Don't cry any more, said Miss Amanda. It does not look well when you open the door for my customers. You have enough to eat and wear. What more do you want? Something to love, said Elsie, but not very loud. She tried not to cry again, and then she felt worse not to shed tears when perhaps her dear little potato child was eaten up. Two days after, as she was still searching, a little piece of white paper in the far dark corner attracted her attention. She went over and lifted it up. Behind it was a hole, and partly in and partly out of that hole lay her potato child. I think a rat had dragged it out of the bin. 
She hugged it to her heart and cried for joy. Oh, my darling, you have come back to me. You have come back. And then it seemed as if the pink eyes of the potato child looked up into Elsie's in affectionate gratitude. And it became plain to Elsie that her child loved her. She was so thankful that she even kissed the little piece of white paper. If it hadn't been for you, I would never have found my child. I mean to keep you always, she said. And she wrapped it about her potato child and put them in her bosom. We must never be parted again, she murmured. At supper, with many misgivings, she unwrapped her treasure for Miss Amanda and asked if she could keep it as her own. I won't eat any potato for dinner tomorrow if you will give me this, she said. Well, answered Miss Amanda, I don't know as it will do any harm. Why do you want it? It is my potato, child. I want to love it. <sighs> See you lose no time, then, said Miss Amanda. And afterward, Elsie never called the potato it, but always my child. She found a fragment of calico large enough for a dress and skirt, with enough over. A queer three-cornered piece, which she pinned about the unequal shoulders for a shawl, and upon the bonnet she worked for days. All of this sewing was a great joy to her, and last of all she begged for a bit of frayed muslin from the sweepings for a nightdress, and then she could undress her baby every night. She must have heard a tiny tuber voice, for she said, Now I can never forget the sound of loving words, and the world is full of joy. Elsie had a candle box in her room, with the cover hung on hinges. It served the double purpose of a trunk and a seat. She put her child's clothes and the scrap of white paper in this box. In the daytime, she let her child sit upon the window sill so she could see the big blue sky. But when the weather grew colder, she took her down to the kitchen each morning, lest she should suffer. Sometimes Miss Amanda watched her closely. She does her work, but she is a queer thing. She makes me uneasy, she thought. Christmas was coming. Elsie and her mother had always loved Christmas, and had invariably given some gift to each other. After their stockings were hung side by side Christmas Eve, her mother would take her in her lap and tell her the Christmas story. So now it was a great mercy for Elsie that she had her child to work for. One day when she had scrubbed the pantry floor unusually clean, Miss Amanda gave her the privilege of the rag barrel. This resulted in a new Christmas suit of silk and velvet for baby, and this she made. When Elsie left the home, the matron had given her a little needle book containing a spool of thread and a thimble for a goodbye present. These now came into play. She used the lamp shears to cut with. When all was done, the babe looked beautiful, except that it had no stockings. Well, it had not even legs. I'll make her a wooden leg and let her be a cripple. Then I shall love her all the better. But after she made the leg, and a very good one, too, she hadn't had the heart to break the skin of her child and push it in. I'll make the stockings without legs, she said. And so she did. Elsie was very careful never to let her child see or mention before her how busy she was for Christmas. She felt very sorry for Miss Amanda and wished she had something to give her, but she could think of nothing except the piece of white paper she found with her potato child. The afternoon before Christmas, she took it from the candle box and smoothed it out upon the cover. It had some writing upon one side. Elsie thought it was very pretty writing. It had so many flourishes. Elsie could not read it, of course, but she hoped Miss Amanda would like it. But how should she give it to her? She didn't dare hand it to her outright, and she was certain Miss Amanda wouldn't hang any stockings, so just before dark, she slipped into Miss Amanda's sleeping room and laid it on the brown cushion just in front of the mirror. 
When Elsie had finished her work, she went to her room, pinned her child's stocking to the foot of the bed, and slyly tucked in the new suit she had made. Her own stockings lay flat upon the floor. Her breath caught a little as she noticed them. But it doesn't matter, she said. Parents never care for themselves if they can give their children pleasure. She crept into bed and took her child on her arm. The night was very cold. The frost made mysterious noises on the roof, in the nail holes, and on the glass. She went to bed early, because the kitchen was so cold. She thought, we can talk in bed. The lock of her door was broken, and she could not shut it tight. Through this, the air came chilly. Miss Amanda put on her flannel wrapper and her bed slippers and sat down before the open fire in her sleeping room. Some way she couldn't keep her thoughts from that little back attic room. She went into the hall, silently up the stairs, and stood outside the door. Elsie was talking softly, but Miss Amanda could hear every word thanks to the broken lock. I have much to tell you tonight, dear child, she heard the waif say. The whole story of the Christmas child... It was years ago. His mother was very young, I guess about twice as old as I am. They hadn't any house. They were in a barn. I think there were no houses to rent in that town, but, but she fixed a little cradle for him in the feed box and wrapped him in long clothes, as I do you, my darling. The angels sang a new song for him. A new star shone in the east for him. Some men with sheep came to visit him, and some rich men brought him lovely presents. My mother told me all these things, and I mustn't forget them. It helps me to remember to tell it to you. So now, this lovely Christmas child, born in a little bit of a town, the town of... the town... Oh, my child, with a mournful cry, I've forgotten the name of the town. I used to say it to my mother. It's the town of... the town of... I can't remember... Miss Amanda could hear her crying a little softly. Never mind, she said presently. I'm very sorry. I haven't told that story often enough. I wish I had someone to teach me a little, but maybe it don't make so much difference if I've forgotten the name of the town. He came to teach us. Sure, I won't forget that. Love can never die. That's the present he gave to everybody. So if nobody else gives us a Christmas present... We always have the one he gave us. Silence for a little while. I am very sorry for Miss Amanda, dear. She has no child to love. She has a very sad and lonely life. Her teeth chattered a little. It seems like a very cold night. The covers are quite thin, but we can never really suffer while our hearts are so warm. I'm glad you feel real well and are just as plump as ever. But your skin is just a little bit wrinkled. You are not going to take cold or be sick. Oh, I couldn't give you up. I should miss you so much, you happy, good little child. Miss Amanda heard a kiss. Good night, dear. I am so tired. God bless us all and help us to remember Miss Amanda and let her find her present tonight. Miss Amanda crept back to her warm room and waited until she was sure the child was fast asleep. Then she took down a quilt off the foot of her own bed, picked up her candle, and retraced her way upstairs. She softly dropped the comforter upon Elsie. She heard as a sort of echo, a soft sigh of content. Miss Amanda waited a moment, and then, shading the candle with one hand, she looked at the sleeping child. The face was pale and thin. The lashes lay dark upon the white cheeks. They were quite wet, but pressed close to them and carefully covered by little toil-hardened hands was the grotesque potato in its white nightgown. Miss Amanda was surprised by a queer click in her throat and hurried out of the room. She stood before her fire, candle in hand, and bitterly compressed her lips, she hopes I'll find my Christmas present tonight. Who will send it to me, and what will it be? 
Whom do I care for and whom cares for me? No one, not one human being. She crossed the room and, placing her candle upon the dressing table, gazed at herself in the glass. I am growing old, old and hard and perfectly friendless. But why that start and cry? Well, there before her eyes, in the big, flourishing, boyish handwriting so well remembered, she reads, Our love can never die. We have nothing in the world except each other, dear sister. And no matter what may come, our love can never change. She snatched up the paper and threw herself into a chair. Where did it come from? She cried. What evil genius placed it here this night? Haven't I years ago torn and destroyed every word that wretched boy ever wrote to me? She tossed her arms over her head and rocked back and forth and groaned aloud. She could not help her thoughts now or keep them from going back over the past. Her heart softened as she remembered, and the scalding tears fell. She was only a child, not much older than the one upstairs when her dying mother had placed her baby brother in her arms, saying, Here is all I have to leave you, Amanda. I know you love him. Don't ever be harsh or unforgiving to him. How had she kept her trust? She had loved him. She had worked early and worked late for him. She had given up everything. But she had been ill repaid. The fire burned low, and the room settled cold and still. She seemed to feel a pair of boyish arms about her neck and a boy's rough kiss upon her cheek. When she was but a young woman, she had moved to the big city and started her dressmaker's shop so that he could have a better chance at school. What a loving boy he was, so full of fun. The wind whistled outside. She thought it was he, and she heard him again. You're my handsome sister. Not one of the fellows has as handsome a sister as I. How proud she had felt when she had started him off to college. It only means a few years of harder work, and then I'll be able to see my boy take his stand with anyone. But now she wept and groaned afresh. Oh, how could he treat me so? How could he, that wretched disgrace? He had been expelled. The president's letter was severe, but the young man's letter regretted it only as a boyish prank. He was sorry. He never expected anything so serious would come of it. He deserved the disgrace. It only hurt him through his love for her. But only forgive him, and he would show her what he could yet do. What had he done? He had tied a calf to the president's doorbell. She remembered her answer to this letter, asking for her forgiveness. It stood before her written in characters of flame. Had she in this been harsh to the boy, the only legacy her dying mother had to leave her? Never speak to me nor see my face again. You have disgraced yourself and me. It was not so long a letter, but she could easily remember it. Afterward, the president himself had written again to her. He thought perhaps he'd been a bit too hasty. It was truly, after all, only a boy's prank. It was, of course, ungentlemanly, but the trick was played on All Fool's Night, and that should have had greater weight than it did. The faculty were willing, after proper apologies were made, to excuse it and take her brother back. Where was her brother? He could not be found and not one word had she heard of him since she sent that dreadful letter. He might be dead. Oh, how often she thought that. Now she wrung her hands and covered her wet cheeks with them. Her hair fell about her shoulders as she shook in her agony of remorse. What noise is this? The doorbell pealing through the silent house again and again it rings. She did not hear this bell. She was listening to another, and how it rang. Louder and louder how it rang, and well it might, with a calf jumping around, trying to get away from it. Even in all her misery, so near together are the ecstasies of emotion. She laughed aloud, and then shuddered at the thought that she should never again hear any noise quite so loud as this of the past. Then she felt 
in the silent, chill room, a tattered presence, a little half-frozen hand upon her own. She turned her streaming eyes, and they were met by the big, wide eyes of Elsie. Miss Amanda, didn't you hear the doorbell ringing? There is something, no, there is somebody waiting downstairs for you. Half-dazed, half-afraid, ashamed of her tears, Miss Amanda left the room, led by the child as by an unearthly presence into an unearthly presence. Who was this bearded man that folded her into his strong, true arms? I have so much to tell you, dear child. I am such a happy little girl. Miss Amanda's dear brother has come home. She is so happy, and she loves him so much, and, oh, darling, they both love me. And it was all you. You did it. Oh, there is no knowing how much good one sweet, loving, contented potato child can do in a house. The End of the Potato Child and Others by Mrs. Charles J. Woodley, 1905. $1.87, One that was all, and 60 cents of it was in pennies. Pennies saved one and two at a time by bulldozing the grocer and the vegetable man and the butcher until one's cheeks burned with the silent imputation of parsimony that such close dealing implied. Three times Della counted it. One dollar and eighty-seven cents. And the next day would be Christmas! There was clearly nothing to do but flop down on the shabby little couch and howl. So Della did it. Which instigates the moral reflection that life is made up of sobs, sniffles, and smiles, with sniffles predominating. While the mistress of the home is gradually subsiding from the first stage to the second, take a look at the home. A furnished flat at $8 per week. It did not exactly beggar description, but it certainly had that word on the lookout for the mendicancy squad. In the vestibule below was a letter box, into which no letter would go, and an electric button from which no mortal finger could coax a ring. Also appertaining thereunto was a card bearing the name, Mr. James Dillingham Young. The Dillingham had been flung to the breeze during a former period of prosperity when its possessor was being paid $30 per week. Now, when the income was shrunk to $20, though, they were thinking seriously of contracting to a modest and unassuming D. But whenever Mr. James Dillingham Young came home and reached his flat above, he was called Jim and greatly hugged by Mrs. James Dillingham Young, already introduced to you as Della, which is all very good. Della finished her cry and attended to her cheeks with a powder rag. She stood by the window and looked out dully at a gray cat walking a gray fence in a gray backyard. Tomorrow would be Christmas Day, and she had only one dollar and eighty-seven cents with which to buy Jim a present. She had been saving every penny she could for months with this result. Twenty dollars a week doesn't go far. Expenses had been greater than she had calculated. They always are. Only one dollar and eighty-seven cents to buy a present for Jim. Her Jim. Many a happy hour she had spent planning for something nice for him. Something fine and rare and sterling. Something just a little bit near to being worthy of the honor of being owned by Jim. There was a pier glass between the windows of the room. Perhaps you have seen a pier glass in an eight-dollar flat. A very thin and very agile person may, by observing his reflection in a rapid sequence of longitudinal strips, obtain a fairly accurate conception of his looks. Della, 
being slender, had mastered the art. Suddenly she whirled from the window and stood before the glass. Her eyes were shining brilliantly, but her face had lost its color within twenty seconds. Rapidly she pulled down her hair and let it fall to its full length. Now there were two possessions of the James Dillingham Youngs in which they both took a mighty pride. One was Jim's gold watch that had been his father's and his grandfather's. The other was Della's hair. Had the Queen of Sheba lived in the flat across the air shaft, Della would have let her hair hang out the window some day to dry, just to depreciate Her Majesty's jewels and gifts. Had King Solomon been the janitor, with all his treasures piled up in the basement, Jim would have pulled out his watch every time he passed, just to see him pluck at his beard from envy. So now Della's beautiful hair fell about her rippling and shining like a cascade of brown waters. It reached below her knee and made itself almost a garment for her. And then she did it up again nervously and quickly. Once she faltered for a minute and stood still while a tear or two splashed on the worn red carpet. On went her old brown jacket, on went her old brown hat, and with a whirl of skirts and with the brilliant sparkle still in her eyes, she fluttered out the door and down the stairs to the street. Where she stopped, the sign read, Madame Sophrony, hair goods of all kinds. One flight up, Della ran and collected herself, panting. Madame, large, too white, chilly, hardly looked the sophrony. Will you buy my hair? asked Della. I buy hair, said Madame. Take your hat off and let's have a sight at the looks of it. Down rippled the brown cascade. Twenty dollars, said Madame, lifting the mass with a practiced hand. Give it to me quick, said Della. Oh, and the next two hours tripped by on rosy wings. Forget the hashed metaphor. She was ransacking the stores for Jim's present. She found it at last. It surely had been made for Jim and no one else. There was no other like it in any of the stores, and she had turned all of them inside out. It was a platinum fob chain, simple and chaste in design, properly proclaiming its value by substance alone, and not by meretricious ornamentation, as all good things should do. It was even worthy of the watch. As soon as she saw it, she knew that it must be Jim's. It was like him, quietness and value. The description applied to both. Twenty-one dollars they took from her for it, and she hurried home with the 87 cents. With that chain on his watch, Jim might be properly anxious about the time in any company. Grand as the watch was, he sometimes looked at it on the sly on account of the old leather strap that he used in place of a chain. When Della reached home, her intoxication gave way a little to prudence and reason. She got out her curling irons and lighted the gas and went to work repairing the ravages made by generosity added to love, which is always a tremendous task, dear friends, a mammoth task. Within forty minutes, her head was covered with tiny, close-lying curls that made her look wonderfully like a truant schoolboy. She looked at her reflection in the mirror long, carefully, and critically. If Jim doesn't kill me, she said to herself, before he takes a second look at me, he'll say I look like a Coney Island chorus girl. But what could I do? Do. Oh, what could I do with a dollar and eighty-seven cents? At seven o'clock, the coffee was made and the frying pan was on the back of the stove, hot and ready to cook the chops. Jim was never late. 
Della doubled the fob chain in her hand and sat on the corner of the table near the door that he always entered. Then she heard his step on the stair, away down on the first flight, and she turned white for just a moment. She had a habit of saying a little silent prayer about the simplest everyday things, and now she whispered, Please, God, make him think I am still pretty. The door opened and Jim stepped in and closed it. He looked thin and very serious. Poor fellow, he was only twenty-two and to be burdened with a family. He needed a new overcoat and he was without gloves. Jim stopped inside the door, as immovable as a setter at the scent of quail. His eyes were fixed upon Della, and there was an expression in them that she could not read, and it terrified her. It was not anger, nor surprise, nor disapproval, nor horror, nor any of the sentiments that she had been prepared for. He simply stared at her fixedly with that peculiar expression on his face. Della wriggled off the table and went for him. Jim, darling, she cried, don't look at me that way. I had my hair cut off and sold because I couldn't have lived through Christmas without giving you a present. It'll grow out again. You won't mind, will you? I just had to do it. My hair grows awfully fast. Say Merry Christmas, Jim, and let's be happy. You don't know what a nice... What a beautiful, nice gift I've got for you. You've cut off your hair? asked Jim, laboriously as if he had not arrived at that patent fact, yet even after the hardest mental labor. Cut it off and sold it, said Della. Don't you like me just as well anyhow? I'm me without my hair, ain't I? Jim looked about the room curiously. You say your hair is gone, he said with an air almost of idiocy. You needn't look for it, said Della. It's sold, I tell you, sold and gone, too. It's Christmas Eve, boy. Be good to me, for it went for you. Maybe the hairs of my head were numbered, she went on with sudden serious sweetness. But nobody could ever count my love for you. Shall I put the chops on, Jim? Out of his trance, Jim seemed quickly to wake. He enfolded his Della. For ten seconds, let us regard with discreet scrutiny some inconsequential object in the other direction. Eight dollars a week or a million a year, what is the difference? A mathematician or wit would give you the wrong answer. The Magi brought valuable gifts, but that was not among them. This dark assertion will be illuminated later on. Jim drew a package from his overcoat pocket and threw it upon the table. Don't make any mistake, Dell, he said, about me. I don't think there's anything in the way of a haircut or a shave or a shampoo that could make me like my girl any less. But if you'll unwrap that package, you may see why you had me going a while at first. White fingers and nimble tore at the string and paper and then an ecstatic scream of joy, and then, alas, a quick feminine change to hysterical tears and wails, necessitating the immediate employment of all the comforting powers of the Lord of the Flat. For there lay the combs, the set of combs, side and back, that Della had worshipped long in a Broadway window. Beautiful combs, pure tortoise shell with jeweled rims, just the shade to wear in the beautiful vanished hair. They were expensive combs, she knew, and her heart had simply craved and yearned over them without the least hope of possession. And now they were hers, but the tresses that should have adorned the coveted adornments were gone. But she hugged them to her bosom, and at length she was able to look up with dim eyes and a smile and say, My hair grows so fast, Jim. 
And then Della leaped up like a singed cat and cried, Oh, oh! Jim had not yet seen his beautiful present. She held it out to him eagerly upon her open palm. The dull, precious metal seemed to flash with a reflection of her bright and ardent spirit. Isn't it a dandy, Jim? I hunted all over town to find it. You'll have to look at the time a hundred times a day now. Give me your watch. I want to see how it looks on it. Instead of obeying, Jim tumbled down on the couch and put his hands under the back of his head and smiled. Dell, said he, let's put our Christmas presents away and keep them a while. They're too nice to use just at present. I sold the watch to get the money to buy your combs. And now suppose you put the chops on. The Magi, as you know, were wise men, wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts to the babe in the manger. They invented the art of giving Christmas presents. Being wise, their gifts were no doubt wise ones, possibly bearing the privilege of exchange in case of duplication. And here I have lamely related to you the uneventful chronicle of two foolish children in a flat who most unwisely sacrificed for each other the greatest treasures of their house. But in a last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that of all who give gifts, these two were the wisest. Of all who give and receive gifts, such as they are wisest. Everywhere they are wisest. They are the Magi. End of the Gift of the Magi by O. Henry Well, you might notice a theme going through both today's stories and most of the Christmas stories this year that were either suggested or, or that we found. The idea of sacrifice, the idea of what you have not being as important as how you feel slash treat the people around you, the latter is far more important in I think all the stories that we are going to listen to for the 12 Days of Craftlet. One of the questions that you often see asked is, why is it called the Gift of the Magi? So Magi was a, a priestly caste in, in Persia, like way long time ago. And it's where we also get mage and magus and magic. All of those, those words that go way back. However, the thing that I think is kind of interesting about O. Henry talking about the gift of the Magi is the three wise men, the Magi, they sacrificed their time, they sacrificed their travel, it was expensive, and it was tiring, and a long way, and they also, of course, sacrificed their gold and frankincense and myrrh, which were incredibly valuable at the time, but they could afford to. They're often described not just as three wise men, but three rich wise men. This is where I think you're going to find the theme going through several of our stories for the 12 days this year. I hope you enjoyed them. Little stories, good stories. And we have more stories coming at you tomorrow. So have a good one. Get all that Christmas crafting done. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive a king. Let earth